Well, good evening. Good evening to the Sunday night crowd. This is what I would call a Sunday night lesson. It's a little different on Sunday night. You can think about things that you might not think about normally, and the lessons might be a little bit different than the normal, quote-unquote, sermon for a Sunday morning, and I think this is one of those lessons. Talking about animals and what we can learn from animals from what the Bible tells us. And if you go to the very first chapter of Genesis, first chapter of the Bible, we'll start reading about animals. Because animals, as you well know, were made before man. On the fifth and sixth days of creation, God made all the animals, everything that walks on the earth, everything that flies in the air, everything that swims in the sea, and he made all those creatures, every different kind of creature, before God made man. And so he made them all, and then he made man, and this is what he says of man in verse 26. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So man is different from the animals. You probably knew that, didn't you? But sometimes you'll hear somebody say, I hear it quite often, I guess because my ears are tuned to listen for it. Oh, man, it's just another animal. We're just one of the animals, but we're not just one of the animals. We are made in the image of God, and we have been given by God dominion over all of the animals. And who doesn't like to go to a zoo? You don't have to raise your hand if you don't. Because most everybody likes to go to a zoo. But when you go to the zoo, have you, have you ever experienced anything at the zoo that is frustrating? You go to the zoo, and the animals are where? They're back in the shade, or they're back in their den, or whatever cover they've been given. They're back in that cover, and they're not out there where you can see them. And if they are out there where you can see them, they're probably laying down not doing very much. Because that's kind of what animals do these days. How would it be, though, if there was a zoo and you could go into that zoo and every animal that you encountered was tame and you could sit down with it and pet it? And how, how great would that be? We do have petting zoos. Do you ever take your kids or have you taken your kids, those of you that have children or taken them to a petting zoo? And, and you take your quarter and you put it in that little corn thing and turn it and, you, and the animals are all over you to get that corn and you've seen the funny videos like I have of people like down in Arbuckle Wilderness have you gone to Arbuckle Wilderness and driven through there with the feed bucket in your car and those animals are trying to stick their head in there to get that feed now that's some great fun right there uh, maybe kind of anyway but that's the way it was initially the animals weren't afraid of people there was, there was no fear they wouldn't run away from you and they wouldn't attack you because nothing ate meat. If you read here in chapter 1 of Genesis in verse 30, uh, verse 29 rather, then God said, Behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky, to every living thing that moves on earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. Were there any meat eaters in the, in the beginning? There were not any meat eaters in the beginning. Every creature, including man, ate from the vegetation. So animals ate vegetation. Human beings ate vegetation. There was no reason to fear any animal. No reason for any animal to fear another animal for fear of being eaten. That's the way it was initially. That's the way God created things. What is the prophetic imagery of peace in the kingdom of God, except the lion does what? He lays down with the lamb. That's the imagery that God has given us, and that's the way it was initially, the lion laying down with the lamb. So that's the way it is as we finish chapter 1. Then we get into chapter 2. Verse 18, the Lord God said it's not good for the man to be alone. He's, he's backing up. He's giving us the details of how he created man and woman. 
So this is before he creates Eve. Creates man and says it's not good, good for him to be alone. So it says in verse 19, out of the ground, God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. You ever pictured that in your mind? I always I see Adam sitting on a big, there's a big stone about the size of a chair and he'd sit on that stone and all the animals would come by, all the birds would come by and Adam would name them all. That's what he did. You ever been to one of those places, one of those, uh, I think it's called an aviary where they have a, an enclosed place with little birds and you can buy the seed there. The little birds will come and sit on your shoulder, sit on your head sometimes, sit in your hand and eat the food. That's, that's really neat. That's kind of what Adam was doing. The animals and the birds were coming by. Adam was giving them all names. But look what it said. Verse 20. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a suitable helper for him. There is no suitable helper for man among the animals. Now we have this saying about dogs, dogs a man's best friend. It's not really true. God made man's best friend. And it was another human being in his image. And men and women are above the animals. We are not the same. And then chapter 3. We're still talking about animals. Who do we read about in chapter 3? The serpent. The snake. However the snake was in verse 1, he was not the same way by verse 14. Because the serpent approached Eve, talked with her, spoke with her, convinced her to eat the forbidden fruit. And then by 14, God is bringing a curse on the serpent. The Lord God said to the serpent, this is Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. The Lord God said, because you've done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. There is this idea that initially the serpent, as the devil approached Eve, he had legs. And when he was cursed by God, those legs were removed. And you can look this up. Don't, don't do it right now. Everybody's got Google in your hand right there. Snakes have places on their bodies that look like they used to be for legs, for appendages. People with evolutionary mindset will say, oh, yeah, that's evolution. Uh, they, they decided not to have legs anymore like that was a decision made by snake. Hey, let's all get together. Let's have a meeting. Oh, we're not going to have legs anymore. Let's just go on our bellies. No, this is God's doing. So this made a change. And we've got the serpent here. Where else do we have the serpent? We've got the serpent in Revelation chapter 12. If you keep a finger here in Genesis, because we're not done in Genesis yet, talking about animals. But in Revelation chapter 12, this is what we read. Verse 7. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon. Did you catch this morning? One of my favorite songs, Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. In verse 2, what are we singing about? Dragons and dragons all. What were dragons? I think dragons were dinosaurs. If God made all the animals on day 5 and 6, he must have made the dinosaurs along with everything else. And so people used to call those dinosaurs, what we call dinosaurs, they would call them dragons. All different kinds. And so here, Satan himself is spoken of as a dragon, but also as a serpent. Verse 9. The great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil, and Satan, who does what? He deceives the whole world. I don't know about you. Snakes creep me out. I don't like to admit that as a man. But my tendency, every time I see a snake, is to want to kill it. Now, I, I know black snakes, corn snakes, hog-nosed snakes, those snakes are all beneficial in the in the point that they do what they kill the harmful snakes and they kill rats and mice but just to see a snake to see a snake move it's it's wonderful and creepy at the same time something about snakes and I don't know 
why it seems to be that everybody has the same kind of sense of weirdness about snakes, but I think it goes back to this. I can't prove that, but I'm just saying that we still see the devil spoken of as a serpent who is a deceiver. And every time you see a snake, whether it's at the zoo or in your backyard, that snake can remind you that the devil is out there all the time. But who's the devil also spoken of like being like? He's like a lion on the prowl seeking whom he may devour. But there's a bigger lion. Who's the bigger lion? Who's the more powerful lion? That would be the lion of the tribe of Judah from Revelation chapter 5. If you back up to Revelation chapter 5, well, you probably already got out of Revelation like I did because I forgot I was going to chapter 5. But here we read about the lion of the tribe of Judah. Verse 5, one of the elders said to me, stop weeping, stop weeping, John, stop crying about the book that can't be opened. Behold, the lion that's from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has, become, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Look at verse 6. This is interesting. I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the, el and, uh, and the elders a lamb standing. Well, who's the lamb? That's Christ. Well, wait a minute. Who's the lion? That's Jesus. Both of them are Jesus Christ, the lion and the lamb. He is what he needs to be in this imagery. If he needs to be a lion, he'll be the lion. He's your defender. He will protect you like nobody else. You're untouchable under his care. But you are also someone who needs your sin to be forgiven. And in that case, Jesus is the lamb whose blood is shed. Jesus is our Passover, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He's our lamb, but he's also our lion. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we've got all this imagery of animals here as we begin reading in Genesis. And as we continue, we, we see it even more. And in chapter 4, or I'm sorry, chapter 3, we haven't finished chapter 3 yet. <clears throat> it says in verse 21, after Adam and Eve had sinned and the curse had been put on uh, the serpent and on the woman and on the man, it says in verse 21 of Genesis 3, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. As far as I know, there's only one way you can get skin. You have to kill an animal. And God could have made anything he wanted to clothe Adam and Eve. But for whatever reason, he chose to make garments of skin. And then he tells us that. He doesn't say what animals were killed or how they were killed. He just says he made garments of skin, and implied in that is, well, okay, animals died. Men sinned, and the result was that animals died when no animals had been dying previous to this. Then we get to chapter 4. We finished with animals? No, we're not finished with animals. It says in verse, chapter 4, verse 1, The man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and said, I have gained a man-child with the help of the Lord. Amen, Eve, always give credit to God. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel, what did he do? He was a keeper of flocks. Now, I might ask, okay, you didn't eat lamb. You didn't eat mutton. Why would you keep flocks? Well, is meat the only benefit of sheep? Of course not. Lots of benefit to having sheep. So Abel kept sheep. And then it says, in the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. How do you get the fat portions of an animal? you got to kill it. So we've got more animals dying because of people needing to make offerings up to God. This is just in the fourth chapter. We're not even very far into the fourth chapter. And it's animals once again playing a, a very uh, integral part in man's relationship with God. Well, you get to chapter 6. Things have gotten so bad. God's going to destroy the earth, so what's he tell Noah? You need to load the ark up, build it first, and then you load it up with animals. What kind of animals? There are two kinds of animals on the earth clean and unclean 
The unclean you put on the ark by twos, and the clean you put on by sevens. And then he doesn't give us a description of what the clean animals are. Now, you know you can go to the 11th chapter of Leviticus, and you can see the animals that were deemed clean under the law, but we don't know if it's the same animals here. Of birds also, he's supposed to take by sevens. So God is still remembering the animals. The animals are part of creation. How dull would life be if it wasn't for animals? If, if it wasn't for animals, you could just drive straight down the road. You wouldn't have to dodge the dead coons or the dead possums or the dead skunk. You just drive straight down the highway. How much more exciting is it? Oh, watch out for that dead skunk. Boy, get that on your tires. Animals make life interesting. You ever have a dog when you were a kid? Or a cat? Or a mouse? Or a gerbil that got away? And for the next three weeks, you wondered... Where's that gerbil? And then you smelled that smell. And you know, oh, poor gerbil. Animals play a big part in our lives. And so Noah gets the ark loaded up. And when the flood is, is about to come to its conclusion, what does Noah do? He opens the window. they got one window in the ark. It's in chapter 8. And he sends out a raven. And apparently... The raven found something better to do. Maybe he would land on floating carcasses and eat from those carcasses because that's kind of the, thing, the kind of thing ravens did. Raven didn't come back, but then it says he let a dove go. And the dove did not find any place to rest her foot, so the dove came back. That's verse 9 of chapter 8. He put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark himself. You get that picture? Noah just reaching out, the dove's coming back, and he just, he, she, the dove just lands on his hand or his arm, and he pulls it back into the ark, the ark of safety. Waits another week, turns the dove loose again. What's the dove do this time? Comes back with an olive leaf in its beak. So we see Noah in the ark, saved by the evils of the world, by the waters of the flood, the waters of the flood washed away uh, the sin of the, of the wickedness. And the dove, this imagery of the Spirit of God returning with an, uh, an olive leaf. And what do we see as a sign of peace but an olive branch? It's, it's like there's a lot of imagery coming to play here. I'm not sure all of it that we're intended to see, but, but there it is. And when we look around us in the world, we see animals and birds and insects. And in all of these creatures, there are lessons. They are reminders. Every week, we gather to eat at the Lord's table. Unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. And those remind us of the sacrifice that God made. But every day, we see animals, birds, insects, dogs, cats, coons, whatever we see. And they all have the potential to remind us of the great God who has made them all and given them all purpose. And so it says in chapter 9, verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant, only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. This is the point at which God says, all right, start eating some of those animals. I'm not exactly sure why God this, did this at this point. Part of it may have simply been because with the devastation of the flood, there might not have been much growing. But I do know that this is the point at which things change. And even though the law would forbid Jews to eat certain animals, later on Paul would write that everything is sanctified if it's blessed by prayer and thanksgiving. When you read in Joel, I know, wow, we're going shooting way up to Joel after being in Genesis. Joel talks about God using insects. God's got an army, and his army is... Locusts. Verse 
Verse 4, chapter 1. What the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. What the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. Awake, drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you wine drinkers, on account of the sweet wine that's cut off from your mouth. For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are like the teeth of a lion, and it's, it has the fangs of a lioness. But he's not talking about lionesses. He's talking about grasshoppers, locusts if you will, who are going to eat everything. And God uses the locusts in this way as he's used everything he's ever needed to bring lessons to the mind of man. In Job, we probably remember the two great beasts that God mentioned in Job, the behemoth and the leviathan. The behemoth was probably a sauropod dinosaur like a diplodocus or a brachiosaurus. And Job had seen it. He had to have for this to make any sense at all. And God describes the beast to him and asks him uh, what he thinks about it. Look at chapter 40 of Job, verse 15. It says, Behold now behemoth, which I made as well as you. He eats grass like an ox. Behold now his strength in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. He bends his tail like a cedar. He's got a tail like a tree. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs are like bars of iron. You might see off in your margin a note that says, we think this is a hippopotamus. The Hebrew word for that is baloney. <laughs> Have you ever seen a hippo's tail? Now, a hippo is to be feared. They are a very fearsome animal, and they can run faster than you and swim faster than you, and they are mean and violent. But this is not a hippo. This does not describe a hippo. This describes what we would call a dinosaur, what the ancient people called a dragon. And then Leviathan, verse chapter 41. You read about Leviathan. He is a monster that nobody can tame and nobody can overcome. And brave men fear when Leviathan shows his head. These are two great creatures that may no longer be with us. They apparently are extinct, as many other creatures have become extinct. But these are the last two that God uses to reason with Job. If you go back to chapter 38, this is where God starts using animals to ask questions of Job to get Job to see how small and incapable of really taking care of things he is, how he lacks insight. Verse 39, this is Job chapter 38, verse 39. Can you hunt the prey for the lion and satisfy the appetite of young lions? Verse 41, who prepares for the raven its nourishment when its young cry to God? Verse uh, 1 of chapter 39, do you know the time of the mountain goats when they give birth? Do you observe the calving of the deer? Have you noticed, have you seen any tiny little fawns around? This is the time of year when they start giving birth to their fawns, little spotted fawns. Verse 5, who sent out the wild donkey free? Verse 9, will a wild ox consent to serve you? Verse 13, the ostriches, he's, his wings flap joyously with the pinion and the plumage of love. Isn't that what you think of when you see an ostrich? It's a love bird right there. Yeah. Verse 19, do you give the horse its might? And he goes on for a while talking about the, the power of the horse and the inspiration that it is. And horses really are inspirational. You watch a horse uh, when he's running, and you can see all those muscles flexing. It's like, wow, that's a, that's a captivating picture. And then verse 26, is it by your understanding that the hawk soars, stretching its wings toward the south? And who among us hasn't wondered at that? You look up, you, you see a hawk sometimes, because there are a lot of red-tailed hawks in Oklahoma, but more often than not, what do you see? Turkey buzzard. Now that doesn't sound very honorable, does it, the turkey buzzard? But when you look at him from the ground, he is king of the sky. He's just a turkey buzzard. When you get up close, he's pretty ugly. He doesn't have any stuff on his head. He's kind of gross looking. But when he's flying, he is something to behold. And he just does what God's talking about here. He soars on those thermals, stretching his wings toward the south. Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? So we've got all these animals that God is asking Job about. And the whole point is, 
I put these animals here as part of your environment for you to enjoy, for you to see, for you to learn from. And I think we're still capable of doing that every single day. I know we are because Jesus used animals over and over and over in his teaching. If you think about it, I just name an animal Jesus talked about. Go ahead. Or had something to do with. What's that? Donkey. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Why not a great big white stallion? Well, he's coming as the king of peace, fulfilling a prophecy that had made, been made hundreds of years before that. Any other animal? What's that? A lamb. He is the lamb of God. He certainly is. So uh, there's imagery there with the lamb. Anything else? Fish. How many times are fish associated with Jesus? He fed the 5,000. He fed the 4,000. He's the one who we, we speak of as having uh, the, the sign of the fish was a, a thing that early Christians used to identify themselves to one another. And when uh, Peter needed to pay taxes, Jesus too, go down there and catch a fish and look in there and you'll find your taxes. After his resurrection, he called to the apostles. What were the apostles doing? They were fishing. He said, cast on the other side. They did. They got a bunch of fish. They went in and Jesus had fish cooking on the ground for them. He also asked the question, if a son asks his father for, for a fish, he won't give him a, uh, we're back to serpents. I won't give him a serpent, will he? How do we know God will take care of us? Because Jesus talked about the birds of the air. You see those birds? How they, they don't work, they don't toil, and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Somebody well observed, though, said God doesn't throw the feed into the nest. So the birds got to get out and work for it, and they work for it. And, and by the way, thinking about that idea, God taking care of the birds, have you not done like I have done, at wintertime especially? It's five gazillion degrees below, and the birds are out there having a big time. How do they do that, those tiny little things? I weigh 200 and none of your business, and you'd think there'd be a nice hot core of warmth in there, and I get outside... And I get cold and nothing flat, and these little birds are out there. And God has created them in such a way. And so many things about birds are wonders. Do you know that their feathers are God's original uh, Velcro? Couldn't think of the word for a minute. But how does Velcro work? Well, with Velcro, you've got these little loops and these little hooks. And that's how it works. One, one piece of material is the loops, and the other piece of material is the loops, and you push it together, and enough of those little hooks grab the little loops, and it sticks together. And, and that's what Velcro does. But have you ever noticed, with a bird feather, if it gets ruffled a little, you can run your finger over it, and it'll, it'll straighten right out. If it hadn't been damaged, it'll do that, because you can't see it with your eye, but microscopically you look, there's a system of loops and hooks running on each one of those tendrils, and that's why a feather will correct itself. And the, who do you, what bird do you think would have the quietest feathers? Well, that would be the owl flying at night to catch his prey. He flies and he doesn't make any sound. And a, a woodpecker, have you ever looked into the engineering of a woodpecker's head? And you know what a woodpecker does. ha. <laughs> All the old people would laugh at that. The young kids go, what? what's that all about? It was Woody Woodpecker. He was a cartoon character from years ago. But that woodpecker will go up to a tree and he'll, I can't do it as fast as he can do it. It just sounds like a machine gun or something. And he's smacking a tar out of that tree, cutting a hole in there with his beak. And I'm thinking, what's his little brain in there doing? Somehow it's cushion. Somehow it works. And when he gets a hole size enough, he's got a tongue that shoots in there and grabs anything in there that's edible and pulls it out for him. God's amazing in his design. And every time I look at creatures like this, I think, wow, God really knows what he's doing. Animals that can survive like they survive, that can find ways to eat, that can fly and navigate, navigate the globe under the water, in the dark. How do the animals do that? All of it is by God's design. 
And every time Jesus would talk about animals and give us some imagery, there's, there's something there to keep us reminded of the way things are. What about a rich man giving, getting into heaven by his riches? How hard is that? Well, that's harder than getting a camel through the needle's eye. And Jesus wasn't saying, oh, it's hard for a rich man to get to heaven and it's as hard as a camel getting down and crawling through a gate somewhere that's called a no. Saying it's impossible. You can't buy your way into heaven. That's what that lesson was all about. And every time you see a camel, it ought to remind us there's, there's no way we'll ever get into heaven without Jesus. That's what a camel ought to remind us of. When he talked about Jerusalem being destroyed, he talked about wherever you see the, the vultures, the eagles, that's where the carcass is going to be. And every time I, I see those turkey buzzards in the sky, I think about that reference to the text. If God wants to destroy a city, even if it's his own city, he will destroy that city. And that's where the vultures will be gathered together. Do not muzzle the ox when he's doing what? When he's treading out the corn. What does that mean? If that ox is, is he's harnessed up to that grist mill and he's pulling that wheel around that grinds that corn some of that corn's going to fall on the ground and Jesus says let that ox eat some of that corn he's working hard for that corn you let him eat it do not muzzle the ox it's not about oxen it's about people the laborer is worthy of his hire Jesus would say all these lessons are in there for us if we'll just take a look at them they're here they're waiting for us and the one that I like the best is the one we mentioned earlier, Jesus as God's Passover lamb. We sing a song, as the deer does what? Pants for the water. Uh, years ago when we lived in Virginia, I was out, it was, a, it was a hot summer day. I don't remember what day of the month it was, but I was out in this place. I was, I was looking for a place to hunt and this guy said you go out on my old farm and, you, and, and I was out on a hot summer day and out of nowhere this deer comes out of the woods a doe and its tongue is just hanging out of its mouth and it's I can't get my tongue to hang out that far he's just panting and he just he turns and he walks right towards me now this is highly unusual when you're a hunter for a deer to just come out of the woods and just walk right at you and he just, he doesn't even look at me. He just walks right past me. And I'm thinking, man, that deer is in need of water so bad, he doesn't care about anything else. He's trying to find water. And I, I see that imagery yet today in my mind of that deer panting for water. And I think I and you, we pant for the one who is our lamb. Because it's not water we need, it's that lamb's blood that cleanses our sin and makes us whole. There's so many marvelous images that we can learn from anytime we open our eyes to what's in this world. The birds, the fish, the animals. You see a dog, you see a hog. You know, Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't give what's holy to the dogs. But I also know that he said... Your father's going to take care of you just like he takes care of the birds. Well, this is, do you understand now why I call this a Sunday night lesson? I hope this has been valuable to you. I know it's been valuable to me to, to see things in the world that constantly remind me of God, and that's what this does. Well, as we bring this lesson to its conclusion, uh, being a Sunday night crowd, I don't know that there'd be anybody here who'd want to obey the gospel, but if you're interested in that, I want to talk to you. I don't care how old you are or what your other interests are. If you're interested in obeying the gospel, I'd like to talk to you. Talk to somebody here before you leave tonight. If you need the prayers of this congregation, there's plenty of us here who can pray for you, and we'll be glad to. Just let us know how we can help by letting us know while we stand and sing the invitation song together.